Hello and welcome to Embedded. I am Elysia White alongside Christopher White. Ben Krasnow is back to talk with us about cameras, cars, and maybe computer stuff. Before we talk to Ben, don't forget to sign up for our party. It is in Aptos on January 28th, which is a Saturday from 2 to 5 p.m. It will be at Little Owl, and it is a hats or hacks event. You should either bring a hat or wear a hack or something along those lines. RSVP in the show notes. What city is Little Owl in? I said Aptos. You did? Oh, okay. It's in Aptos. Damn it. I was wondering how to pronounce it properly. Which is in California. And it it is not Aptos, which is the Spanish pronunciation, but Aptos, which is the American Indian pronunciation. Hi, Ben. It's good to see you. (laughs) How's it going? It's been been fine. Good. Uh, Could you tell us about yourself? Sure. Uh, My name is Ben Krasnow. I'm the host of the Applied Science channel on YouTube. And I think we just turned uh, six years and uh, I also work at Verily, which is Google Life Sciences, which is Alphabet's life science uh, sort of portion. Cool. Before we ask you about all the things we asked you to come over and uh, tell us about, we want to do lightning round where we ask you short questions. We want short answers. And if we're all behaving ourselves, this doesn't become an hour long discussion about robots. Okay. Favorite processor. Uh, ARM Core 32-bit. Favorite fictional robot? Read the HAL 9000. Most important tool to your daily work, and I'll just leave that open. Uh, soldering iron. All right, that was on the list anyway. (laughs) Most important tool to your applied science work slash hobby? Hmm, I guess I'd have to go with camera, but that's kind of a cop-out answer. Well, since I want to talk to you about cameras, that's okay. what, that works. Favorite type of wave? Um, an ocean wave. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. I think we can help you with that later on. What science fiction technology or concept do you think will be real in our lifetimes? Self-driving cars. <laughs> <laughs> Least favorite electrical component. Ooh, man, that's, the good, that's a good one. Least favorite. Um, hmm. That's a really interesting question. <laughs> Least favorite. Maybe a processor, a microprocessor. Yes. <laughs> Ooh, ouch. Okay, what's your most favorite? <laughs> most favorite? How about a resistor? It's kind of hard to like mess that one up. <laughs> well, like, yeah, but it's not like it's oh, I got see. any personality. When to I was it. thinking of favorite, unfavorite, I was thinking of like what's caused me trouble in the past, right. you know, <laughs> yeah. <in my> career. <laughs> Well, in that case, microprocessors are not my least favorite as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's, that's kind of, okay, I interpret it a little differently. How much time or, or what year do you think we'll get to the point where 10% of the U.S. has truly self-driving cars? Like level five, as they call it, like fully autonomous. Yeah. 10%? Um, I think it's going to happen pretty quick, maybe in the next five years, 10 oh. years. Cool. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Do you have any others? All right. Okay. So now let's get to those camera questions. You got an early Kronos camera, the yeah. Kickstarter with the super high speed and and it slows down fast things. <laughs> <laughs> what drew you to that camera? Um, well, I've always been really interested in high speed video. I mean, it's so cool. And then being on YouTube where the whole medium is about interesting video, uh, playing with a high speed camera makes a lot of sense because it is about the medium, right? Like it's perfectly suited for YouTube videos. And then uh, my friend, David Kronstein, who invented and built that camera, uh, offered me an early prototype as with a lot of other YouTube creators. Uh, he knew that getting some video out would be you know, a good way of showcasing the camera. So that's how I got my hands on it. What videos have you done with it? Um, I had a couple. um, I've made two YouTube videos that show a bunch of clips that I've collected. And the first one, I have a a mechanical rig that spins the camera around like a center of rotation so that the camera is always facing what's at the center. And it spins in an arc that's maybe 
you know, 60 centimeters in diameter or something like that. So it's kind of like a matrix bullet time effect where you can film something in the center of the arc. And then as the camera spins around it, you know, if the thing is happening quickly, it, you know, shows it in slow mo. It looks pretty cool. You know, in one of your videos, you mentioned bullet time effect, and I had no idea what you're talking about until you you just said matrix. And I'm like, oh, right. I yeah. remember. I know. I actually realized that not many people know like what the effect names are. And so then I was trying to think of how could I summarize it in a title and like spinning camera rig with slow-mo action or something. And so I settled on bullet time. But I actually did one get one guy that said I disliked this video because I was expecting bullets in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> so, well, I mean, high speed bullet videos can be really interesting, yeah. especially when you see the shock waves and they're supersonic yeah. and all that. But but yeah, I can see. So I don't have a gun. Otherwise, I could have done bullet time of bullets, which actually maybe I should do because that actually sounds pretty good. <laughs> okay, that leads me to another question. Have you ever been injured in the filming of your videos? Um, wait, like on camera? <laughs> 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 that I edited out later? <laughs> sure, yes. Um, actually, potentially, but it's always like, like not exciting stuff, like not like, um, like incidental injuries. Like I remember I got hurt pretty bad. I was um, showing how to temper steel. And so I had these thin bars that I was pulling, like I, I had a very heavy weight that I would add to the bar and then it would buckle, it break at some point and I'd measure how much weight was in the bucket to figure out how strong the bar was. And so I, I hardened the steel and then the, the bar became so strong that I had a bucket with like 80 pounds of steel in it trying to rip this eighth inch bar apart. And finally, it let go, and one of the pieces of steel like came down on my on my thumb, and it left a big gash and everything. But it's not a very like you know sort of exciting injury, right? <laughs> no, it, although it it does sort of uh, want you to say, you know, I'm glad I wore safety glasses. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm kind of I think safety glasses are pretty good, but they're kind of like I don't know over like they're not going to save you from a lot of things. And then when you do have them on, it's kind of, I don't know, it's, it's more like dust and particles flying and stuff. But yeah, I, I do wear safety glasses. I do recommend it. <laughs> so back to the camera, the lighting ends up being a huge part of being able to make it work. Yeah. Um, daylight is good. So you'll notice a lot of channels like the slow-mo guys on YouTube shoot in daylight a lot because it's <laughs> free and it's everywhere. Um, but indoors, yeah, you need a lot of photons. So David Kronstein also built like the world's largest LED array. I don't know if you've seen this on his channel. It's like 10 panels of 100 watts each, all aiming at his like, you know, his high speed studio, which is pretty incredible. Water cooled everything. And that's because at the frame rate we're dealing with, there's just not enough light coming in. Yeah, it's a physics frame. problem. Yeah. And there's nothing you can do. I mean, you could make your image a little, your sensor a little bit more sensitive, but with existing CCD technology, yeah, it's your exposures are down to a couple hundred microseconds at the highest speeds that that camera can go. Is it a really small uh, uh, f-stop? Um, that's the other thing. You you can try to open your lens up to like f2. But then you can't focus on it. <laughs> yeah, your depth of field is short. And then also the lenses don't perform very well at that setting. So you kind of want to stop down as well. What other settings do you have you played with? Um, white balance is good. So another thing that makes videos look much better than, you know, if you look at a video, you can't really put your finger on what makes it look pro. White balance is definitely one of those things. And I was happy to see that David has a custom white balance in the camera. So you can aim it at a piece of paper in your scene and hit custom. And then the, the colors come out really nice. I don't think we mentioned how fast it is. Uh, it's at 720p, I think it'll do 1500 frames a second. Okay. And then at, at its tiny resolution of, you know, like hundred by hundred, it does maybe 10,000 frames a second or something like that. Something Have you like tried that? that? Um, yeah, you know, it's funny for a lot of things, it's actually too much. <laughs> yeah. So, so if you're doing like bullets, then you need speed that high. But if you're doing things like water pouring or, um, even like things breaking, like glass breaking and stuff, you actually don't need that much speed because it's not going quite that fast. And then you get way more resolution. And so it's a much more you know, compelling looking image. Have you thought about uh, using the extremely high speed or the high speed mode uh, coupled with a microscope to look at like bacteria processes or something like yeah, that? Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. So at work, we have a high speed microscope and it's definitely meant for research. It's black and white only and it has, you know, like metrology tools. Um, but what's cool is that you can take any old lens on a camera and just move it away from the image sensor and get it to focus much closer. So you can turn almost any old camera into a, you know, a microscope just by extending the lens, which I've done uh, with good effect. So I've got a, a video of like an ant and it's almost filling the frame. I mean, it's pretty cool. 
you ended up building a lot of support equipment uh, to move the camera. And I know there are some people out there who think who who got to the Kickstarter and said, I'm going to get this fancy camera. I'm going to be able to do all these neat things. But they don't realize it isn't quite point and shoot. Actually, no, I'd say it is. Um, w- one of the nice things, if you're shooting high speed, you don't really need a tripod because your clip is less than a second long. In a lot of cases, you just can't even shake fast enough for it to matter that much. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a funny little side effect. But if you go out to the park and you want to get like some high speed video of a river or a waterfall, you can just hold it and you'll never see the camera. You'll never see the hand movement in the final footage. <laughs> I noticed you, uh, you acquired a hummingbird for a little while. How did that happen? He flew into the garage, actually, and I was trying to, like, escort him back out, but he hung around long enough where I could get the camera fired up, and I got maybe 30 different clips of him and picked the best one and put that one out. That was pretty cool, because hummingbirds are just one of those things that are pretty endlessly fascinating. It is, a, yeah, it's a very weird creature. He was in there long enough where I put out a little cup of uh, sugar water for him, because he was hanging out for quite a while. Did you name him? No. <laughs> <laughs> So what advice do you have for people who are going to get a camera like this? Um, I think that um, the fact that there's more high-speed cameras out in the world gives people more flexibility to be artistic with them. So up until now, most of the high-speed footage that people have seen is like sort of setups, like um, you know, balloons popping or you know, things in a lab setup. But if you have one and it's portable, it's battery-powered, you can just take it to the park and find an interesting-looking bug and capture it. I mean, you have some pretty amazing footage. And so just getting more cameras out there, I think will open it up and people will come up with more artistic looking shots. See, I I like the really low speed cameras that you leave open at the sky for (laughs) an hour. So it's funny, there's this huge dynamic range between things you can look at with a high speed camera and things where it's almost the same technology too. You want low noise and and that kind of thing. Yeah. It's funny playing with time compression. In fact, I've been thinking about weird stuff to do where you could even have like log time in cameras, maybe where you could go all the way from uh, time lapse into real time, into high speed. And I was thinking of a process that could make use of that. So we we should- Plant germination. Ah, that's an interesting one. Like flowers opening and then- Yeah. Huh. That could be rather interesting. I like this. Yeah. What else? So you can also do tilt shift photography. Like if you've seen this where you uh, yeah. take like uh, an image from the top of a building and if you tilt the lens, you can get both distant, distant things out of focus as well as close, but the middle is in focus. So it looks like a miniature. It's a really, you got to look this yes. up. It's, it's a very a, strange thing in our brains. It's super, super like unusual. And then when people combine the technique with time-lapse, it looks like a tiny little village of like little machines moving around. It's really crazy. You should look it up. And I was thinking, well, I wonder if anyone's ever done tilt shift high speed. This could be like pretty crazy too. And for that, you'd need to probably, does it work with a standard lens mount? Or? Yeah, it's oh, interchangeable. Okay. That's the other cool thing. It's battery powered, which is unusual for a high speed camera. And it also has interchangeable lenses. So you can put any old uh, C-mount lens C-mount, on okay. there. Yeah. What plans do you have going forward? Do you have a list of things? Yeah. So the first one was this Um, bullet time effect rig, which was pretty cool. And then I linearized it. I basically stretched the camera out onto a linear rail so that I could move laterally really quick. And then the next step after that was to put uh, a pivot on the lateral transition so that it was always looking at the same point, but moving really quick past it. So it was kind of like this drive-by effect. That was pretty good. And then what I wanted to do was tilt the whole thing upright so that I could move the camera like faster than gravity and then pour water or something off the table and have it sort of chase the water or even go faster than the water. I figured that might look pretty good. I haven't done that one yet. That sounds pretty cool. Sounds like you're slowly reinventing the ILM yeah. motion capture <laughs> stuff that they did in the 70s. Yeah. And so it's it's kind of fun playing with a camera that, you know, it's, I, I think everyone should have one, right? Because there's so much unexplored territory, right? I mean, there's just all kinds of things you can do with it. I'm thinking your rig, rig that does linear now you need a little little tiny horse to run along so yeah. you can recreate the original camera system. <laughs> exactly, or insects flying and stuff. Like, a, yeah, it, it would be really good to have these sort of controlled setups and stuff. Um, another trick I did was to change the lens focal length as it's moving on this linear rail. And so this technique is called dolly zoom. Uh, I don't know if you've seen like oh, right. vertigo, you know, or mm-hmm. something like that, where they, the camera is moving physically toward the subject, but then you're also changing the zoom of the lens. So you end up with this really strange like perspective change. And I pulled it off in high speed and the effect was 
well, I think it was pretty good. It kind of showed the potential, but the camera was already doing like five meters a second top speed, or maybe not quite that, but three meters a second top speed. And like the action wasn't quite enough to keep up with the effect. Yeah, so okay. I needed to go even faster, but it was still pretty cool. It's the first time anyone's done dolly zoom in high speed, I'm pretty sure. You had a video where you described all of these different techniques and I I don't play with cameras very much and definitely not videos. So it was neat to really understand the difference between pan and zoom and tilt. I just, yeah, listeners, you should look at that. It was pretty cool. The lingo goes on and on too. I think, yeah, I only mentioned a few of them, but the um, camera operators for pro video have like, you know, a dictionary of terms that just mean things like side to side, but that, you know, it's, it's like in boats, right? It's like a whole different terminology for everything. How did you learn all this? Well, you know, I spend a lot of forever on the internet, just, you know. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I understand that one. So you have a Patreon. Yes. Patreon. Yeah, we were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. P- p- something. Depending how I'm feeling about, yeah, the fans supporting me, you can switch between Patreon and Patreon maybe, right? <laughs> Why? Why? Well, you know, it's um, it's kind of like the death of TV, right? Like we're basically witnessing the end of broadcast video. And so it's pretty cool to actually put your money where your mouth is and say, no, I'm actually going to pay for what I want to see. And then it gets created. You don't have to wait for a network to decide to fund a, a television show anymore. So I think the whole concept is, it's super revolutionary. It's going to put, I mean, cable's already on the way out, but it's just like the last nail in the coffin, basically. So... And that makes sense from a, I like to support people side and, and the people that I want to give money to when they do neat stuff. You have the other side, you receive support. What went into making the decision to do that? Um, it certainly makes it easier to buy like kind of, I wouldn't say silly stuff, but kind of like, you know, if you're on eBay and you see a a weird looking device for, you know, $350, you're like, oh, it's too much to play with. But if you have Patreon funding, you could do an interesting teardown and everybody wins. It's basically crowdfunding this this teardown that might be pretty interesting. So I thought it was a way of sort of, you know, literally just distributing the cost of literally what's in the video. So this linear rail that I bought from eBay was a few hundred bucks or more and the motor was another few hundred. So basically the cost of that video was paid for by the people that saw it. Pretty cool. We recently signed up, and one of the reasons we signed up was because you had one. It, it feels odd. I mean, we have jobs, and these are our hobbies, and you so hobbies normally are a giant money sink. So <laughs> it's in the tradition of sinking money, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and so it felt a little odd. I agree, and so I, I usually get about. I set it up such that I, I pay back about 10 or 20% of everything I take in to other creators. And that, that makes me feel like I'm part of the ecosystem and it's, you know, it's helping other creators get along too. Um, I had a lot of people sort of request that I start taking money. So back in the days before Patreon, I had YouTube fan funding, which funny enough was actually formally announced to be shut down yesterday by, <laughs> um, by YouTube. And it wasn't very, it wasn't used by very many people. It was just a tip jar basically. But people were like, yeah, you know, I want to get in here and, you know, oh, you should make more videos and I'm going to pay you and this, you know, and everything. And, um, you know, almost at the fans' request. And then it became, you know, a pretty decent way to pay for all the stuff. So it worked out pretty well, I'd say. It's working out pretty well for us, too. I, I did it because I failed to send a guest a mic. And there was no reason why I didn't send it other than our two loner mics that tend to get shipped out around the country hadn't come back yet. And... And the guest said they had a mic, and I was like, okay, fine. Turned out the mic they had was terrible. And, and I whined on our Slack channel, and Chris Gamble said, well, why? Why Why do you not just send the mics? I'm like, because this hobby sinks enough of my time and energy. Yeah. He was like, this is why you have, this is why you do the funding, because that shouldn't be it. And now I'm I'm set up to send out a whole bunch of mics on Monday. <laughs> No, it works out really well. There's only one downside that I've encountered is that um, I kind of feel like my own videos have to have a higher standard of, you know, quality because everyone's paying all this money in. And so there's a slight like guilt factor. Where it's like, oh, geez, I can't make a two minute video that's like not substantive enough because I, you know, see the, the amount of money pledged per video. And it's like, oh, geez, I can't really do that. So it's it's funny, the people that were paying in hoping that I would make more videos you know, it sort of backfired since I'm actually going to make fewer videos now that might be higher quality, but definitely the number is not going to be as high. 
<laughs> that's not so bad though. I mean, I think it's nice to have some motivating factor for things that's a little bit outside and, you know, money is a classic motivating factor, but, you know, but it's also tied to guilt a little bit, right? It's like, well, you're paying me, so I better keep making yeah, stuff yeah. and I better, you know, use it as an opportunity to improve. So, I don't I think, think that's so too, yeah. all bad. Since you asked about cameras, I, uh, camera gear funded through Patreon, especially for a while, I was on this kick of increasing my production value quite a bit. Um, you know, better lighting, more cameras, much better framing of the shots, better audio, everything. And funny enough, I don't think the fans particularly liked it. Like the the, the range was like slightly positive to like mm, somewhat negative. You've sold out. Yeah, well, it's a little bit of that. And then people are used to YouTube having like this look. Yeah, the yeah. homemade look. Yes. And so even like huge stars, you know, PewDiePie and all these guys, it's a very like different look than television. It's not, it's low production value. And that's actually what people kind of prefer. And the which sound is, too. Yeah, which, yeah, which a crappy sound and everything, right? And so, you know, it's, I, hey, that's great because that's cheaper and easier. So why not? <laughs> this is good info. If I ever start a YouTube <laughs> channel, I, see, I would go completely nuts in the high production value. I, I've definitely talked to other creators that started a channel with high production value and people are like, what is this? It looks too much like television. Are, are you funded? Like, is this a studio? Like, this doesn't look like YouTube. And so there, it, all these questions cause people to not be subscribers. And then it's like, well, <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Why are we punishing professionalism? So, so you're telling me we should lower our values? No, no, no. <laughs> so audio is actually one of the things that um, can always be done better. And it doesn't sort of distract people if it's perfect, right? Like audio is one of those special things where it's like, I'm going to talk about like animations or title sequences. If you have really good audio on your channel, everyone appreciates that. And it doesn't get in the way of like, you know, perceived YouTube-ness or whatever, you know. Oh, I, I think that's very true. Yes. Yeah. And knowing the listeners that we have, if our audio quality went way down, they would be very unhappy because that's been one of our our strengths. Well, when I say our, I mean his, Chris. Chris is all about having really good audio. It is a nice setup. And I had one guy that would complain on every one of my videos saying, you know, your audio sucks when I was using my, my camera's microphone. And he's like, why is it so loud in the left channel and not the right channel? And I'm like, well, it's because I'm standing on the left side of the camera. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And he's like, well, then fix it in post or something. I was like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hours in the day. But you, on back to the Patreon, Patreon, whatever we're going to say that, um, you you actually have the goals and stuff. And do you have special content for? Um, sort of. You mean the rewards? The, like yeah, the, the, the supporters, reward tiers? yeah. Um, I send out stickers. So that's right. a good, that's got, a really, that's good. good. Yeah. yeah. So that's a common support tier. And then I didn't really, I was already pretty strapped for time. And so I didn't really want to have um, a reward that would take a lot of time. Yeah. <laughs> so I was trying to figure out how to do that. Originally, I thought I would have no tiers. You know, it's totally, you know, egalitarian. Everyone pays what they want. You know, there's no like tiering or anything. And then I thought, well, maybe it'd be cool if people sent me in stuff to show on the channel because yeah. that would be less time on my part and people would get their sort of, you know, peace on it and everything. And so that, it hasn't really worked out quite that well, but some people did sign up at those tier levels anyway and never sent me anything anyway. So, <laughs> Well, that's because you didn't send me your address to send you a sticker, but that's okay. Since you're in studio, oh. there's no way you're leaving here without a sticker. Y you didn't get it? I already sent it to you. No, you sent me a sticker. Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to send you something to put on your wall. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Oh, I have embedded FM stickers too. Oh, all right. I think I gave you my address. Well, anyway, we'll, well anyway, oh, okay. <laughs> what's happening? I think ben if, will be leaving here with stickers. I think if right. you check the latest video, it might even already be on the wall. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Someone should watch the guest video before they arrive. Maybe. I'm not sure, but I think so. <laughs> so we mentioned we're having this party. Have Have you met many of your subscribers um, over the years? I mean, because you've been doing hmm. this for years six years this this season actually very close to six years exactly probably yeah um have i met very many of them probably only incidentally at like the hackaday meetup uh, at the end of last year and um yeah that and maker fair that would be the other big one yeah is it strange to not meet them no to meet them <laughs> to meet them <laughs> to not meet them is just like normal right <laughs> I'm constantly not meeting people. Yeah, me too. <laughs> well, you know, I'm not really a social creature. And so, you know, I, is it weird to meet them? Um, most people are pretty cool about it. Occasionally, it gets a little too fanboy-y. And that's that's a, a slightly weird, but it, it's pretty cool. I like meeting them. Sometimes they find they know more about me than I remember ever having said. And that's a little strange, but... 
I have encountered that. Sometimes someone will say, you know, a video you made, you said such and such like four years ago or something. Like, really? <laughs> yes, I don't, I don't like even it. remember that video. <laughs> I, that happened last week Yeah, for a, a podcast that we made two weeks ago. So I can't remember, you know, it's gone. <laughs> yeah. Who exactly were you making the fondant cake for? Uh, that was my housewarming party in <laughs> Redwood City. Yeah. <laughs> that so was that so, wasn't a, <laughs> a no, mystery. And, no, and, th- and that's, uh, that was one of my most popular videos for a long time, actually. There's more cake bakers in the world than there are, like, science hardware tinkerers. And so most of your channel, for people who haven't seen it, is is you make something odd and then you, you talk about the science and the creation of it. Where something odd could be miniature $1 bills because you use a- ammonia and pressure to, to disquoosh them. Um, but then you have a series of videos where it's literally you baking a cake. <laughs> I haven't done that in a while. That was, that was early days, right? But I mean, you know, it's time to bring it back. Yeah, well, you know, I, so, okay, so format changing is dangerous, right? Like, you've seen YouTubers that try to, like, shift their focus, and, oh, man, people hate that more than more than bad audio, even, right? Well, you you had a comment in there about, and I don't usually read the, the YouTube comments because it's just horrible, although you get some pretty good ones. Yeah, it's, I like it. But there was one in there about how you had an itty-bitty kitchen in a giant garage. Yes, well, that's true, actually. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> and really, the, the, they were talking about your priorities, and I I thought that was very fair. Oh, yeah. No, when I was looking for that house, I told my real estate agent, I I don't care that much about the house, but the garage has to be substantial. And she's like, well, I can't type that into MLS. And so (laughs) it was kind of a long search. In fact, it was about a year and a half of searching. (laughs) As Ben came over today, we mentioned that we sort of found our house by accident on the first try. That's a year and a half of searching. Yes, I I do understand because we did that before, but it was easier this time. That's nice, yeah. Sort of. <laughs> okay, so moving along, you, a coworker of yours, said that you build mechanical solutions to do things that we would do in firmware. What did he mean by that? You know, I'm not exactly sure. It sounds intriguing, though, doesn't it? <laughs> it really does. Was this, so potentially, so the Lighthouse tracking system that's used in the Vive is kind of a mechanical solution that other people used cameras for. Probably not what this person was thinking of, but it is, in fact, a very mechanical solution. A lot of people are like, ah, oh, spinning motors and mirrors, that's going to be terrible. But it actually turned out to be a very successful uh, tracking system for VR. We had Alan Yates on the show, and we talked about how that worked. And it did sound implausible, <laughs> because you have all of these timing requirements and this reproducibility and moving parts that shouldn't be that precise. We were actually really surprised when we fired it up the first time and got without even trying that hard, a hard drive motor to be precise within like 200 nanoseconds, spin to spin or whatever it was. He measures it in parts per million, like how far it's off for one rev. And it's pretty incredible what you can do with just a pretty bog standard hard drive motor. It is really incredible. Of course, I should point out they don't use standard hard drive motors. There was more effort that had to go into it, but... um, What was the starting point? Yeah. But it's still, it's interesting to take advantage of a technology from a completely different field and I wonder how many other things are out there like that that haven't been done yet. Like, okay, hard drive motors, hard drives have to be very precise. They can't have a lot of uh, walk, uh, axial walk, because, you know, they have to read very precise positions. So there's got to be other stuff like that that's been totally commoditized. But now, okay, this is really precise and we can take this and we can make something that would have been a million dollar instrument a decade ago for a couple hundred dollars. Exactly. And that's sort of been my job kind of all along at, at most of the places I've worked is sort of finding those really quick and easy solutions that at least to get us past the prototyping stage. So that did that brings up a question from a listener who asked who has a goal for 2017 to do more prototyping. Oh, that's good. That's a really good goal. A listener. <laughs> <laughs> An enemy podcaster. Uh, do you have any advice for how he can do that. Wow. So like specific technical advice or like mindset maybe? Let's go with mindset. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, you know, I mean, failure, I think, I think the talk of like failure has gone a little too far. Like a lot of people talk about, oh, you know, failing is great. Fail and we, fast. Yeah, fail fast. It's great. If you know, you're not failing, you're not trying. Exactly. I if you're not that. failing, you got to do this and that. And it's like, I, my take is like failure is kind of part of everything. It's part of engineering. It's part of life, but you don't really try for it. And so 
don't like <laughs> don't try to fail basically is what it comes down to and some people i think hearing all this talk of failure especially in like earlier education where people haven't really understood that there's nuances to the meaning of failure um it, like getting hung up on it and so my point is basically just keep going like don't think about how you're going to fail or how it's not going to work just kind of keep putting more uh, effort into it and concentrate on the on the day to day i agree with that i i hate that fail fast thing because I think I understand its original intent, but I don't think it's, I don't think that's stuck for very long. Yeah, exactly. And companies I've worked at that have pushed that, uh, it tends to mean let's not plan. Let's just hack around, you know, randomly trying things with like a shotgun approach and we'll just throw out everything that doesn't work and, you know, kind of a, a, a Darwinian approach to design. And I don't think that's a good way to do things. Yeah, exactly. And, and that isn't really the ultimate goal anyway. So it's kind of like, well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, succeeding is always better, right? So, you know, it's, yeah. Yeah, and you do learn a lot from failure. That's fine, too. So That's I, I, different. Yeah, it's definitely different. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't even call it a failure. I mean, if you tried something and then you ruled it out, that's progress. I mean, that's part of how it works. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of, there's a lot of truth to that, I think, also in research, where oh, yeah. a negative result is not something that is desirable, and yet it could be very interesting and publishable, but people want the positive results. It, exactly. So they actually almost the same problem that uh, Silicon Valley does where they're like, so well, I guess maybe it's the opposite of the inverse problem, whatever, but they, they won't publish negative results. And so then people figure, oh yeah, well, you know, I can't ever, even though that is valuable stuff. Yes. Cause if you don't publish, then other people go down that path too. And then they don't publish and then it's all a giant waste of time. So let's also talk about the paths that don't work. Yeah, exactly. And if the cost of publishing were way lower and you could just easily access everything, it would be great. And so we could rag on like science journals for a while. Then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go back to, uh, to actually, let's, no, let's stick with failure. Okay. How do you deal with it? Um, say, say in terms of applied science, your, your, oh, yeah. your video channel. Do you have, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but have you had videos that you've tossed? Um, yeah, sometimes the making of, of I think I have, I usually shoot B-roll footage first. Um, you know, for viewers that don't know, B-roll is sort of like, um, like action shots of me using a lathe or something. So there's no audio or there could be audio, but it's not that important. And then A-roll is me staring at the camera and talking. So I always shoot all the B-roll first as I'm doing the project then shoot the A-roll at the very end and then splice in parts of the B-roll to make it, you know, more interesting. So I, I have B-roll that I've never made into a video. And um, usually I'm so strapped for time that if I go through the trouble of <laughs> building something, I'm going to squeeze a video out of it pretty much. <laughs> but um, there's, there's definitely a bunch of B-roll footage that's on the cutting room floor for sure. Yeah, that, but I mean, that's kind of by nature, of course, you go ahead and set up a camera because you're working anyway. Why not? Yeah, sometimes I forget, though, and then I don't even have as much B-roll. And you can tell those videos because there'll be like a shot of the camera just looking at a desk or something <laughs> with audio. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking over it. I'm, I'm narrating it, but I don't have any B-roll for that section. And so it's just nothing, basically. <laughs> so you have never like mostly finished a video and said, wow, this is a really boring topic. What was I thinking? Hmm. Have I ever gone that far? Probably not. No, I think once I'm that far along, there's no turning back. At some point, you just ship it. Yeah. Now, I have sometimes made videos that I didn't charge Patreons for. So, I have the option of uh, posting a video yeah. and then saying it's a freebie video. And I've done that a few times. That actually might be the best solution to do. The I short was ones. thinking yeah. the two-minute videos, you could absolutely do that. Exactly. I think that's probably the best balance. So I should do that more. It's fun and, and it keeps things going. I know with the podcast... Uh, over the holidays, we ended up recording a whole bunch in a short time. And then we had big blank spaces on either side. And there was some amount of getting back into the pattern. And so, yeah, there's some. Yeah, definitely. I used to have a pretty sweet work schedule where I was doing four days a week at my day job. And so the extra day I had for, for videos, and I, you know, didn't have to, but sort of, sort of strongly um, incentivized to uh, give that schedule up. And so now it's really crunched, you know, I had way less time to make videos. Was that part of your negotiation? Uh, yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to do, I have this video thing. Is that okay? I mean, did, oh, you, yeah. did it come up? Oh, absolutely. And so um, 
when I was working at Valve in Seattle, because of the geographical distance, I was here, they were in Seattle. I, I negotiated this day here to sort of finish up things and it just sort of got grandfathered in. And then somehow I transferred that over when I started working at Alphabet. <laughs> and I know that when you started working at Alphabet, you already had the videos. They didn't, um, that was, I mean, that was one of the reasons they knew you. Exactly. And do they still support that now or do they want all of your attention? No, no. And they want the five days a week, but uh, I can, you know, make videos talking about technical stuff. They're totally cool with all that. Yeah. They yeah. just want all your time. Though. Well, it's reasonable. I actually don't feel overworked and I think Verily has a really good work-life balance. Um, it's just having that extra day is like a really significant thing. It's like, even if it were like four 10 hour days, that would be yeah. better because it's really like having that whole separate space to like play with. And so, you know, it's, it doesn't really work to be out of the office an entire day a week. And so I can kind of see their point. Yeah. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> well, kind of. Like I say, they made it a pretty good, uh, it was, it was a very tempting uh, offer. So yeah, it was, it worked out. It was, but it's a tough balance. It was. I, it is, in fact. They, I, they must have gotten the number just right since it was like, man, this is a tough choice. So <laughs> so you do have a full-time job. Yeah. And you have the videos. How much time do you put in to the videos? Um, not, if, you know, it's not so much anymore. I mean, at the peak, it was almost a video a week, which was absolutely nuts. Even at one, even at having a spare day, I mean, even that was pretty crazy. I think my average probably during the, the heyday was maybe a, a video every other week. And now it's like a video a month, you know, or, or even less. So, <laughs> um, But, you know, weekends are good. If I get like a full Saturday, that's a really good time to kind of get a video nailed out. Yeah, if nobody convinces you, you need to go to the beach. Right, right. <laughs> How do you choose what level to explain things to? Sometimes you take very complex scientific things. Do you have a, a mental model of your audience member? Do you have somebody who actually are explaining it to some person? That's actually, yeah, it's an interesting idea. I, I don't, but I like that idea a lot. I think that I should, I'm going to use that in the future, actually. Um, I, I'm not thinking about explaining it to a person that I know, but I am using my own um, frustration at having p things explained to me in very convoluted ways. So, like, electrical impedance was, like, a perfect example. Oh, jeez. I know. I still can't get that stuck in my head properly. <laughs> it's like, why do they make it so complicated? Yes. So, in, in school, um, I had to take a few EE classes, even though I was an ME in school. And it's like, okay, we get to AC circuits, and they have to explain impedance. And they do it in such a way that no one could possibly understand it right. the first time they come out. I mean, they're using imaginary numbers. They're using really complex math. I mean, it's like, why? You could just talk about it in sort of terms. Like, just what is it? It's resistance that depends on frequency. It's it's really that. That's yeah, it. they never said that. <laughs> they never said that. They never will either. And so, it's very frustrating. And so, I, I actually get a kick out of explaining things in really simple terms because I wanted to explain it out to me when I was learning it. <laughs> Everybody does. Yeah, you would I know. So, why does no one do it? <laughs> so it's, I, I think they go down that path because part of the important part of impedance deals with like, you know, waves and antenna. So the interesting stuff about impedance is about reflections and, and efficiency. So they just skip to that and then ignore the easing you into an analogy that makes sense, you know, from basic electronics. And, yeah, because the plumbing analogies with the little pipe and the big pipe, not, not really. <laughs> you don't like that one? Uh, it's not the worst, but then you lose, then you get this mental idea that it's a, a block instead of having it depend on frequency. I see. Um, but then I don't have a mechanical right. implementation of impedance like that. It does start to, yeah, the analogies start to break down when you push on them too hard. So yeah, it's... Yeah. Uh, there was a great video on YouTube I found, and it's from either the 60s or the 50s or 70s, something very old where a guy is explaining impedance. Uh, I think it's with Bell Labs. I'm going to find it. But he has this mechanical uh, model where he can make the waves go with this, uh, it's kind of a, like a, a cascade of tinker toys. Nice. And you can see the reflections and he talks through the whole thing. And it was a really good explanation of that aspect of, of impedance because you could actually visualize it. And he could lock things down and change change the, basically the impedance of this mechanical system. Um, Sweet. I'll find that. It was a good video. You're saying instead of asking, what is your least favorite electrical component, we should be asking... What is your least favorite electrical property? Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, and people would say impedance because they don't understand it. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah. But yeah, that's the other thing. You know, a lot of these like 50s and 60s videos were actually way, way more yeah. uh, clear than modern educational equipment. And it's like, well, that's, I mean, yeah. Uh, there's something about, you know, they had to work really hard to make this mechanical model. It yeah. was very large, probably it was very expensive. And it explained it better than, you know, somebody putting up a, a video screen with, you know, lots of colors and waves going around everywhere. I mean, it looks fancy when you're doing that, right. but this was like, oh, this is very simple. It takes up a whole, ta whole table, but... I like uh, it. Yeah, I really like that kind of stuff. My second career was always going to be in education, too, and maybe it still will be. But yeah, that's... I, it is partially already. Yeah, exactly right. You're, right, exactly. You're headed in that direction for sure. Yeah. It's funny. I've always thought that education and how we explain things does fall to a Darwinism sort of thing. The better you can explain something, the more likely somebody else will use that explanation to teach the next person. That's good. Yeah, I like that. And yet somehow impedance has... <laughs> well, there's cracks there's in the like facade, an, yeah. There's, there's like an island over here right. with good impedance explanations. Yeah. And it, it's I would say a whole connected. lot of basic introductory physics is broken too. <laughs> It's like an emphasis on mathematics, which yes. I don't quite understand. And it's it's useful to use math to solve problems, but I don't think it's very useful to use it to describe sort of how to understand something, at least not for me. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. I like math, but I like it second to yeah, yeah, exactly. concept. Exactly. Uh, and you said you were a mechanical engineer. For some reason, I thought you were electrical or even software. So. That, that this question of how did you learn all this mechanical stuff is sort of pointless, isn't it? <laughs> how did you learn all this electrical stuff? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Switch it. <laughs> well, I actually wanted to be an EE, but the math killed me. <laughs> <laughs> now we see the truth. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, and it, it is true. Um, I never actually formally signed up as EE, but I mean, I, I knew what was going to happen when I started looking into it. And so I was like, yeah, I think, uh, I think we'll go with mechanical. So <laughs> what's funny is uh, the opposite happened to me. I really? started as an engineer and said, ah, I'll go back to math. Uh, really? <laughs> I'm kidding. Huh. Oh, so you must, and you don't even like the mathematical descriptions of these properties. Um, I think they're useful depending on what your path is in education. I think they're very useful if you plan to go, you know, very deeply. Right. But I think for people who are, you know, stopping at a certain, at another point, like, oh, I'm going to be an engineer. So let's get these physics com concepts down. I think it depends on the audience. And right, I think right. there is no tailoring of it to the audience, especially early on in undergraduate. Cool. Okay. So for people who are not mechanical engineers, how can they gain more facility with doing these things like you do? Yeah, that's good. Um, I think um, having a good space to work is pretty important. So I've always had the benefit of having like a really big shop. So even when I was growing up, my dad had a, a really well-stocked garage, lots of tools and space to just play around. And um, if people don't have that space of their own, you know, finding a good maker space or something like that could work out pretty well. But sort of having like a dedicated spot that you can always go to and um, tinker out there is a pretty important part of understanding this stuff, I think. That's an interesting, interesting advice. I always try to like play with origami on the couch and it really doesn't teach me the mechanical things I want it to teach me. So yeah, going to a space and having the physical uh, tools would help. What tools do you think are most important? Um, I like, to have a milling machine so that that one's probably the most versatile and it's true that you know it doesn't work as well on sheet goods as a laser cutter uh you know maybe it doesn't do 3d printing as well because you can't have undercuts with a milling machine but generally you can get almost everything you want out of a decent milling machine what's a decent milling machine um well again it's sort of a sliding scale so ideally it would be a pretty hefty three axis you know four thousand pound machine but if you can't have that uh, some of the desktop ones are actually not bad these days. Have, do you have another mill? Uh, no, actually, I don't. Okay. That, that seemed like a tool that I, I would expect you to have because it, it is desktop and it's very oriented towards the maker community. Yeah, I think I, I really like that tool for PCB milling, actually. It's a pretty cool application for it. I'm spoiled. I already have a Bridgeport CNC in my garage, yeah. so <laughs> kind of... <laughs> Who needs a tiny desktop when I have this monster? Yeah, and I mean, well, it would actually, so it would be better for PCB milling, uh, another mill, for, for sure. Um, that actually would be pretty nice, yeah. Do you have a laser cutter? Nope. 
Uh, I've got a nice one at work. And so, again, if I need to cut something one or two times, it's not, uh, yeah. There is some advantage to working with that company. They do have some nice tools. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and Valve too. I mean, they, they, you know, employees can use the shop for, you know, little projects here and there. So what spiffy tool are you excited about for the future? Um, so have you guys seen this Wazer, this like desktop water jet cutter? What? I know. Oh, no, that doesn't seem likely possible no, no, or no. safe. <laughs> well, no, no, it's real. In fact, it's, it's a Kickstarter, so it has to be real. <laughs> but it, <laughs> it is, in fact, real, and they, they have videos of it working. Um, I'm not sure precisely how well it works, but they, they successfully Kickstarted, and I'm, I almost signed up. I was really close to, to getting on the Kickstarter. It's like maybe four or $5,000 or something like that, so it's a pretty hefty machine. Um, it's desktop in the sense that it's, at the height of a desk, but it's it's very heavy, of course. It's a water jet. Um, I, I would like to have that if it works as well as I think it does. I mean, that's it's pretty cool. So water jet works by um, shooting very, very, very high pressure water at whatever it is you want to cut. Yeah, or so kill. It's sort of like a laser jet, but much, much more so. Yeah, the cool thing is that it doesn't care what material you have. And so it'll cut stone, metal, paper, glass, glass, glass yeah. foam. I mean, any like hardness, any like material you've got, as long as it isn't too thick. And even that is pretty, I mean, it can even do, the big ones can do like five inch thick slabs even. So there's almost nothing it can't cut. And it also doesn't push on the work like a milling machine does. Like the cutting force is almost zero so that you can do really intricate stuff and you don't even have to clamp your work down. <laughs> you can just put it on there. It works just like a laser cutter. It's a kind of magic. Like it's one of the most like magic-y tools out there. And to have like a desktop one for five grand is actually pretty awesome. The, the big ones cost two, three hundred thousand dollars It's just not even close for, you know. It's... Well, it's because generating that much pressure. Yeah. And having enough uh, stuff on the side so that you don't cut through and hit tank. the people on the other side. <laughs> it's pretty cool. And so I've looked into, I actually bought a nozzle for a water jet cutter and was thinking of connecting it to like the biggest, baddest um, a pressure washer that I could get just to see what would happen. And if you could only cut like eighth inch aluminum, that would actually still be pretty interesting, right? By hand. Um, initially, but I was going to get a cheap CNC machine and kind of test it out. But to, you to, should do it by hand first. Well, I was. Oh, of course. This is YouTube. I mean, of course, we're going to like, you know. <laughs> and I, I got close. I haven't done it yet, but I've got like most of the parts except the, the actual water jet pump. Um, okay. So could you please add like a blue laser to it, uh, a blue LED to the near the nozzle so that it looks like a lightsaber yeah, for me? Yeah. <laughs> that's, could, you could, I might be able to do that actually. Um the amount of power in those things is staggering. Like it's like 40 or 50 horsepower for most of the largest, you know, mid sized water jet cutters. And when you think of this in electrical terms, I mean, the motor itself is like, you know, 500 pounds of motor just to generate that much power. So it's, I don't know what you're going to get with just a plain old pressure washer, but, you know, I think these, I think the Wazer guys basically did this and they got a nice, you know, pressure washer motor and it doesn't cut quite as well as the big machines, but you know, so what? For eighth inch aluminum, it might be just fine. And it sure would be fun to try. I can, I can totally yeah. see that. Yeah. Another thing people may not know is it's actually abrasives that do the cutting. So the water is just sort of like the motive force. It's actually a little sand. It, they actually add sand to the jet. Oh, do they? Yeah. So it's it's actually an abrasive jet cutter. Um, and in, without the sand, it won't cut hard materials. I, I, that makes sense. Let me say it, of yeah. course. But they do use uh, water only to cut things like um, food, like beef and cake and all kinds of stuff in industry, because then you don't want the abrasive in there. Don't you have to submerge it? How do you cut cake with a water jet and not have soggy cake? You'd be really surprised. It's it's on like a... It's on a... Um... These are the deep penetrating questions. <laughs> well, you know, I wondered about it too. So we had we had like foam inserts, water jet cut. Uh, at, at Valve for a while ago and they came back, you know, bone dry. And we're like, how did they even, like, what, did they dry them out afterwards or something? But if you put the piece of work on a, a spoil board so that the water kind of goes through and doesn't come back up, like splash back up very much, the jet is going so fast in the f and it's so concentrated that it's literally like a knife. It doesn't even get the work very wet. All right. Well, I know what I want to use to cut my next cake. No. <laughs> <laughs> So how do you stay current? How do you learn about these things? Um, I think Twitter is probably, oh, I, I read Twitter a lot. And I'm sorry. 
<laughs> well, you've got to know how to use it, right? Like you got to. <laughs> it gets worse, though. Unfortunately, I also read Hacker News, which is. I'm really sorry. I know. So that's actually worse in a lot of ways. But I can't stop doing it. In fact, it's bad because. I'll have like Hacker News typed into my computer before I'm even fully down in my chair yet, you know? <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I don't really like listening to people argue, but for some reason it's okay when it's on Hacker News. <laughs> but I mean, there is a lot of good news on there too. Yeah. And that is how I get a lot of um, information. Okay, so for Twitter, because I'm on Twitter, uh, I don't find Hourly Kitten to be exceptionally good at making me current in tech. Who do you follow that is good? Um, I think people can check my stuff. So that's, that's yes, but you're yes. not gonna. I do. Who do I know? Like off the top of my head, like yeah. um, who posts good stuff? Basically, Oh, geez, I don't know. Um, we'll we'll ask hmm. you after the show. Okay. We'll, we'll come up with some answers. Um, and Hacker News. Hacker News is Y Combinator. Yeah, news dot Y Combinator dot com. And so it's mostly I like that because it's a little bit more. Um, neutral in a lot of ways. Even though they somehow managed to still have lots of flame wars, there's no politics. There's absolutely no political news on there. Really? Because no. I don't follow very many people on Twitter anymore. <laughs> no, it's just angry angry tech people. Yeah, see, well, yeah so they, they're very opinionated, <laughs> but it's not about, at least they're not, I mean, you know, occasionally a topic will drift into it, but there's no headlines where it's like, you know, what did Trump do now or whatever, you know, it's like, I mean, that that's totally off, which is very refreshing. And so, you know, so that's not, in fact, it's the only news source that I know of that's filtered in such a way that it's literally only about tech and business news. So hmm. that's nice. We occasionally post our show there, but we don't have any particular like automated process. So it is only occasionally. It's, there's a lot. So back in the day, it was um, much less heavily, you know, there, there was less competition to basically get on the front page. And now it's just insane. I mean, it's, yeah. It's, We've never gotten on the front page. Yeah, it's 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 tricky. I mean, it's and then even like big news stories will get bumped up and down, and if it's submitted multiple times, all the votes get spread out to like all the different ones. And so, yes. Uh, any any place else you'd suggest people look um, for? Let's see. It's funny that social media is is on your list. But... Only Twitter. Um, I, I have a Facebook account, but I haven't logged in in probably a year or something like that. Um. I have Tripoli Magazine. I actually like I Tripoli Spectrum. It's still a good magazine. Um, they carry, occasionally infuriate me. <laughs> <laughs> they were very against electric cars. Yes. This or was maybe still are, against. but I just knew that was probably the one because I remember looking at that too, like, what do you guys are mean, man? What do you? <laughs> really? And, and articles on and on about how it was never going to happen and they were horrible. And then there'd be like a tiny blurb about Tesla has sold a whole bunch of them. And yeah. It was just sort of. I thought that was kind of weird too, but so yeah, occasional stuff like that. But they're, they they have good stuff. Sometimes they have really good stuff. Yeah. And YouTube too, actually. Um, a lot of research uh, institutions have a YouTube channel, and so they'll post their stuff at the same time to YouTube that they do to like you know pro news outlets. And so even just watching YouTube is actually pretty good. That's a good point. Do you find uh, have you connected with other YouTubers in any way? Is there like a little cabal of of, uh... <laughs> yeah, so the, the the if you if you're into that VidCon is where you go. So VidCon is the conference for YouTube creators. It's in LA, I think, once a year. And um, I've talked to people that have gone. It doesn't really sound like something that I might like that much. I mean, I, I probably would, but you might have to meet people. Well, that's I know that's one downside. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little um, it's a little like high school where it's like you know if you meet someone they'll say oh uh you know how many subscribers do you have and if oh, you say uh, oh you know about 800 they're like oh <laughs> i'll start talk to you later <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry i'm gonna go over here now <laughs> yeah Eight, 800 million right? yeah right <laughs> is that you mean 800 oh okay well <laughs> so there's a little bit of that but um i have spoken to other youtube creators a fair bit over you know back channels and email and stuff and usually we're discussing things like hey did you get ripped off on facebook again yeah how are you dealing with it oh do you have a name of a lawyer that we could talk to uh. to prevent getting ripped off again <laughs> So it's mostly, yeah, that kind of help. Oh, all right. I can see how, why you wouldn't run out to do that. Yeah. I mean, occasionally there'll be a nice call out. Like occasionally someone will say, you should check out this person's channel and we'll have a few back and forth and stuff. It is pretty neat. Cool. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to ask you for a couple of channels you'd recommend, but oh, yeah. I can do that offline. Okay. And put it in the show notes. Good. Do you have any advice for mid-career engineers uh, about getting burnt out. I mean, you do a lot of stuff and you 
always seem enthusiastic and passionate about what you're doing. Yeah, I, so I have to admit, I got pretty lucky. So the job I have is all about prototyping, which is what I really like to do. And so that's, you know, not everyone gets kind of the, you know, the gravy jobs like that, right? <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I, I, let's see, advice to not get burned out. To avoid burnout or to mm. stay connected to technology. Right. Um, I think, I mean, you know, it's, it sounds redundant, but maybe watching YouTube is a good way to see what's exciting, right? So the nice thing about YouTube is that it's self-filtering where people don't make videos about stuff they don't like. And so it's kind of inherently um, exciting because people only talk about what they're interested in, as opposed to like the real world where you have a job and you might be forced to do something. And so it's not as, it's unfiltered basically. Um, similarly, going to like a meetup, the only people who would go are the ones that like talking about this kind of stuff. So it kind of self filters for people that are already enthusiastic, maybe. I don't know. I have resolutions, New Year's resolutions about going to places and meeting people. It's not that I like it. It's just that I have to be there because <laughs> I made a resolution. Yeah. I mean, I, like you say, I'm totally not a social person, so I, I completely understand. And I think you can still communicate with people asynchronously too. I think that's actually one of the, the best things about, you know, the internet, of course. I do think your where do you go to learn things and and your how do you stay interested or connected? Because you you mentioned the same place for both, and I think some of that is one way to stay connected is to learn stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like the Hackaday uh, uh, meetup was pretty good at the end of last year. That was a big one. Uh, fair number of YouTube fans there, um, and also old friends too. Actually, that I had worked with in the past it was a pretty nice meetup. Yeah, I heard some Valve folk were there. Yeah, it sounded fun. It was yeah. So you were talking about prototyping. Can you talk about your BLE prototyping technique? Yeah, so this this is pretty cool. This is actually something I recently did too, so it's all fresh in my mind. Um, for a lot of projects that I do at work now, our job is to get sensor data from a, a little battery powered device uh, into the cloud basically. And one pathway is uh, from a sensor through Bluetooth into a phone, which then uploads it to the cloud. So the link that we have to work on is sort of the sensor and Bluetooth into uh, an Android phone, basically. And so I came up with this framework to do that, and it's really easy. So I, I, don't, I don't actually write that much code. Like I, I definitely stay more on the engineering, like hardware mechanical side. So anything that saves me writing code is like a really, that is exactly what I want. So I found this perfect solution that I don't think many people know about. The sensor itself is Philip Frieden's OSH chip with a Nordic NRF52 uh, on there. Mm -hmm. And that's great because you can program it through embed. You don't even need a programmer. You can just connect. Um, well, actually, I use Philips programmer, but you don't need to um, have like a compiler set up. Embed is an online compiling okay. tool. And then it's cool. You plug the thing in and it appears like a USB drive and you just drag the file that the compiler downloads into your browser onto the thumb drive and it programs the device, which is pretty sweet. So that... I mean, it's easy, the, and they already have, uh, for example, like an Eddystone broadcaster. So you can just drag and drop that into your project, and now you're broadcasting Eddystone packets. I mean, it's a little bit more work than that, but it's it's pretty good. The advantage to Embed is there is a lot of code out there that's pretty simple to use, and the Nordic chip has a lot of uh, example code that is relatively straightforward to if you don't want to modify it. Exactly. If you and want it, to modify it, it gets more um, complicated. It's true. Not so I'm not, yeah, so I, I like C. I, I don't like C++. And unfortunately, most of the embed stuff is like full yeah, on, yeah. heavily abstracted, like super out there. And so that wasn't so great. But at least it's working and it's easy to program. So that's that part done. So now you have a sensor sending BLE packets. And on the phone side, I don't know if you've ever tried to program an Android app. It's, yes. it's heavy duty. <laughs> Yes. Really heavy duty. And so it's I was like, gross. there's no way I'm going to do this. So I found a perfect solution. Processing.org has an Android mode. And you can use processing to make an Android app in five minutes once you get it installed. Processing is the C++-ish language that is used to program Arduinos. Yeah, and it's Java in Android mode even. Okay. Yeah. So you, you download the JDK and the Android SDK and this and that, and then you basically just say, send it to my phone, and it, it literally just shows up on your phone when it's plugged in through USB debugging, which is slick. Now, it gets even better. Now, there's no Bluetooth, of course, because it's, it's just an Android app and, and processing doesn't know about BLE. But I found a library on GitHub of this guy that wrote a BLE library for processing.org in Android mode. Why he didn't compile it, I don't know. So on GitHub, it says, oh, all you have to do is just fire up Eclipse and compile my library, and away you go. 
<laughs> I, I almost died because that was, I mean, that, that almost killed me downloading Eclipse and getting his library compiled, but I did it. And so now I have BLE working in processing.org and can make an Android BLE app in three minutes. That sounds pretty cool. We're going to need more links. Yeah. And even better, once processing is, it's on the internet. So you can take that data and do HTTP GET requests and pump it into the cloud with basically no effort. It does. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's good stuff. Neat. I'm glad I asked. And we have had Philip on the show. So if anybody out there is wondering why they've heard of this, it, it may be that, or maybe you heard of it somewhere else. And I'll have that show look show link in the show notes. Oof. Clearly, I am losing the ability to talk. So let me ask a few more questions. Do you have a favorite video? Maybe something that is usually overlooked? Um, a I favorite think, video that you've done, just yeah. to be clear. Okay. We're, we're, not, we're not talking Star Wars or anything. That'd be, oh, okay. Well, um, I think my favorite would have to be my first electron microscope video, because that's really the one that launched this whole endeavor. So that was like early 2011. Um, yeah, well, so I had videos before that, but that was the first like really big one. And um, that was kind of what started the whole thing. Probably the reason I'm talking to you now is because of that video. So it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. It made it to Hacker News. But funny enough, it doesn't have as many views even now as some of my more recent, more popular videos because YouTube has grown so much in the past few years. Yeah. And they don't, they don't prefer like old videos. Like they, they recommend mostly recent stuff. On the idea that, yeah, I mean, there's... It's the algorithm. There's reasons for that, but yes. Um, it is funny when somebody writes in and says, have you ever done a show about X? And we're like, yeah, that was show 11. And like, <laughs> well, maybe we could do another one. It's It's been a while. Uh, let's see. Do you have a VR system? I know you worked on Valve's VR system, but do you actually have one? Yeah, so I have an HTC Vive Pre. And my computer at home wasn't powerful enough to run it. So I, I brought it into work. And we actually have a dedicated room set up. So originally, I set it up at my desk. And there was literally like a line of people out the door waiting to use it, <laughs> yeah. which was fun, but super distracting. So we actually set up a dedicated space. And that's, that's worked out really well. What do you play? Um, I like the creation tools. So Tilt Brush is one of my top favorites. Yeah, That keeps getting better and better. I yeah. need to go back and retry that because I keep adding stuff to it. Uh-huh. So that's the one where you have a paintbrush or a sort of clay and you can make your own whole 3D art, drawings. 3D drawing. Yeah. And I did this weird poster place with a tree and some water and it was really fun. And at the end, my arm was very sore because you actually have to paint, you have to move a lot. It's pretty cool to tell someone you can paint fire in midair and it will just hang there. I mean, it, people instantly get it and it's super enjoyable right from the start. It's very intuitive. Yeah. And, and you can put stars in the sky and they yeah. twinkle. It's yeah, really it's, cool. It's, it's, well, now you can, they, I think they recently changed so you can change how big you are. Oh. So you can work yeah. on fine detail and then, you know, work. So you can build a whole city. Actually, you know, I haven't seen that. Very that sounds small, pretty awesome. shrink down and do fine detail. Nice. So, yeah. That is really cool. Huh. I feel like we're going to need a, a camera to go inside the VR system pretty soon. So you, I know that probably exists. To, but, uh, to see you can see what someone's painting? Well, like like you do with the Kronos camera, but now we need it inside. Oh, oh I see a VR camera system. like on a rail or something like yeah. that. Oh, uh, yeah. Huh. I don't, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means because like it's all head mounted and that's where the camera lives. Toldbrush has some interest. They have like a... Um, like a, it sort of tries to give you perspective. Like it'll kind of move your viewpoint back and forth, and it'll make an animated GIF of it to show the three D ness of it on like a, on a flat monitor. Oh, if you export it, yeah, yeah. exactly. That's kind of neat. It'd be like a twenty minute GIF. Sometimes. Oh no, no, it's just back and forth. Oh, oh, if you want oh. the full fly through, yeah, I don't know yeah. if they can do that just yet. Maybe, maybe. Cool. Have you seen the new uh, Google Earth app in VR? No, actually, I haven't. I. I was a little sad that they don't have um, Street View yet. Oh, yeah. Because I've heard they've done Street View of the Louvre, and I wanted to go mm. walk through that. I was just so jazzed by that idea. But you can go to cities, and, and you can step on the Eiffel Tower. Uh -huh. But, of course, it doesn't have any destruction, which is another feature I would ask for. <laughs> but you can't, I mean, you start out kind of in orbit, and then you can zoom down to arbitrary size. Uh, then you can grab the sky and move the sun wow. around and stuff. It's kind of cool. In different times of day. It was it was pretty neat. Sweet. It shows you just how dense some cities are and how huge other spaces are. 
it was pretty cool. Yeah. In five years, you'll be doing 3D VR videos of your, your stuff so people can Could look be. over your shoulder while you're yeah. doing stuff. Some YouTubers have done full 360 videos to kind of play in with the four. Some people, um, Frank Howarth is a great uh, sort of pioneer of interesting YouTube formats. And he did a uh, a 3D video where the camera was sort of like in the middle of his workshop and he was working like around it. Like the table saw was on one side you know, the, the shaper was on the other side. And so he'd walk back and forth and you could actually like turn your head back and forth, follow him around the shop. It was pretty creative. There's just so much on YouTube. You need to get another Kronos camera, put them <laughs> side by side and then and do 3D high speed. That would be, that's a really good idea. You should tell David before, because he's going to have, so David's going to have like hundreds of cameras before he sends them all out to the backers. And someone's like, you got to do like, you know, interleaved framing where you could have like a billion frames per second, you know, if you <laughs> <Jeez>. sort of. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With that thought, um, I think I'm out of questions. Chris, do you have any? Questions? For Ben. For Ben. Oh. oh, no, I don't think I have any more questions. What about you, Ben? Do you have any last thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Um, we didn't talk about self-driving that much. But I think that my final thought is going to be um, how the bar for AI always moves. Like people say, do we have artificial intelligence? No. But if you had said, you know, 15 years ago, oh yeah, self-driving cars will be around in 20 years, no problem. You're like, oh, that's crazy. We don't have AI yet. <laughs> so the bar for AI is always higher than where we are now, even though we've probably crossed it many, many times over. Yeah, we'll have fully, you know, humanoid androids walking around talking to us and people that's not real yeah they're yeah, not really intelligent right because they're not really creative or whatever they'll always have an excuse you're like chess playing or go playing like oh no no that's just an algorithm so they'll be saying that while they're exterminating us yeah now, those much. are really intelligent ah! it's true i actually think it's well i mean i don't know if they'll get exterminated but it's true the bar will keep going up until it's at ridiculous levels i think and at one point it'll be above our intelligence yeah. and therefore we won't be classified as intelligent <laughs> <laughs> i did fail to ask you about cars because your car doesn't have any driving self-driving capability yet not yet there was an update last night and i was like oh, all right you know and i installed it and nothing happened so <laughs> yeah that's what that's what you get for being on the bleeding edge i know i know uh well maybe we'll, we'll take you out and see if you want to try our self-driving opportunities um but if we do that we have to stop recording so our guest has been ben krasnow of the applied science youtube channel you can check out his Patreon Patreon page by searching for Applied Science on that site. Thank you for being with us, Ben. Thank you. It was great. Thank you also to Christopher for producing and co-hosting. And of course, thank you for listening. Do sign up for the party. The RSVP link is in the show notes. If you'd like to say hello, hit the contact link on Embedded FM or email show at embedded.fm. You can also subscribe to the YouTube channel or the newsletter. Those are all on the site, embedded.fm. And the blog. And the blog, yes. I, I'm sorry, I shouldn't forget the blog because the blog is very cool. And now, a final thought. This one's sort of convoluted. It's from uh, Henry Marsh, a doctor, a neurosurgeon, in his book, Do No Harm. On one of my regular trips to the neurosurgical department in America, where I have an honorary teaching post, I delivered a lecture entitled All My Worst Mistakes. It had been inspired by Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, a brilliant account published in 2011 of the limits of human reason and of the way in which we all suffer from what psychologists call cognitive biases. I found it consoling when thinking about some of the mistakes I have made in my career to learn that the errors of judgment and the propensity to make mistakes are, so to speak, built into the human brain. I felt that perhaps I could be forgiven for some of the mistakes I have made over the years. Embedded is an independently produced radio show that focuses on the many aspects of engineering. It is a production of Logical Elegance, an embedded software consulting company in California. If there are advertisements in the show, we did not put them there and do not receive money from them. At this time, our sponsors are Logical Elegance and listeners like you.